This is the second event that we're holding on the, the future of NGOs. The first one was held in December. And we focused on, um, can someone close the door, please? Yeah. We, we've, we focused on the changing environment for NGOs and, and, and the viability of the, of the current organizational form. This evening, we're going to be focusing on the, the business model. But let me step back a minute. What is the START Network? For those of you who don't know, the START Network is a consortium of 19 UK NGOs. There are two legal agreements between these organizations that enable them to collaborate in an open-ended way and disperse money around the world. This network has a, an ability to work in 200 countries through 6,800 uh, partner organizations. It's just getting started. In fact, what's happening this week, no pun intended, what, what's happening this week is, is, uh, is we're instilling a new system of governance. So Monday we had uh, our first general assembly and today we had our first conference. And this is the, the end of a, of a very exciting day for us where we debated and voted on motions for the evolution of the network over the coming couple of years. Why are we having this conversation this evening about innovation and business models? Well, from where I sit, where I see, where I look, the sector is stuck. NGOs are stuck. We have this old-fashioned Victorian business model that requires people to suffer and die before bad news gets on the front page of the newspaper, and that front page of the newspaper triggers public donations, and that public donations triggers political will that triggers service delivery contracts. It's a reactive model. NGOs are filled with people who want to make the world a better place, who think about deeply the structural injustices of the world and the reason that people suffer, and they want to do something about it, but they can't because they're stuck in a reactive business model. And that's what tonight is about. Is there a way out of this? Everybody knows that the world is changing quickly and rapidly, and, and, the, and NGOs need to evolve. But we're stuck. So that's what tonight is about. Is there a way out? Can we find new business models that will enable us to be more proactive, enable us to, 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 to respond to, to things that we can see but do nothing about until we have the money? So that's what tonight is about. And we have a really exciting panel of people. I'm going to be introducing these people one by one as, they, as they're about to speak. But you know, for the moment, rest assured, you see, you see their bios in, in your pack. They're, they're, all of them innovators in, in business models for, for NGOs and humanitarian response. So I'm really looking forward to tonight's um, discussion. So the format is this. We're going to use a kind of a modified Ignite format. If, if those of you who are familiar with the Ignite format, most of the speakers will be speaking for five minutes. And their idea is to ignite the conversation, to ignite your thinking about business models. So they'll be basically giving you about one idea in five minutes. Now, it will be capped at either end by 10-minute interventions. Um, one will be about the context of NGOs, and one will be about what it feels like to change and, and how to actually innovate. And so it makes sense to me that, that we have these 10-minute interventions. And in between, there'll be plenty of space for you to talk and, and, and discuss. So we really hope that we can catalyze a, a, a group conversation. We've got some roving mics, and uh, so... Um, the emphasis is on you to, to, to react to what these people are saying, and, and, and we can hopefully have a conversation about, about uh, changing the business model. So audience discussion is less pleased about uh, asking questions of the panelists. Their job is basically done when they give you that one idea, and then they're going to sit down. So if you have a specific question for somebody, uh, save it till the end, please. We're, we'll all go out and have a glass of wine at the end of the, of the session, and there'll be plenty of opportunity to talk with the, the presenters if you have specific questions. So I hope the format is clear, and I hope you're looking uh, as uh, much forward to what's going to happen tonight as I am. Let's begin. The first speaker is Rose Caldwell. Rose is a colleague and friend. Uh, she is the CEO of Concern Worldwide here in the UK. Um, she's an accountant, a chartered accountant, worked with KPMG, so she's seen many different ways of working. And uh, Rose has also been the vice chair of the Start Network board and, and been an active uh, person in, in uh, forming this new way of working for four years now. And so we've asked Rose to speak about how she sees the NGO ability to evolve and what's coming down the pipe that we need to think about. Rose, over to you. 
Thank you very much, Sean. First of all, I want to start by saying congratulations to the START team for a fabulous day today. I know not everybody in the room was here, but I think we've had a very thought-provoking mm -hmm. day, which is uh, lots of controversy, lots of different discussions, and a very um, useful day. And also to Sean and his team for getting us to as far as we've, we've got to. I mean, someone just said to me, oh yes, I was involved with START during the wilderness days. We did have <laughs> about two years of wilderness days, so it's lovely to be here in a different format when START is really taking off and going in a very positive direction. So well done to Sean and the team for that. Um, someone once said that the only predictions that come true are those that aren't predictions. So I'm not going to make any predictions tonight. Rather, I'm going to share some thoughts to stimulate the debate and possibly more than one idea. Um, as the Executive Director of Concern Worldwide, a mid-sized INGO, we are grappling with and considering what we might look like in the next 10 years, in the next 20 years. And I think this is very much a multi-layered issue. And we need to consider it sort of firstly in terms of looking at our judgment based on assessments of our own strengths, the value that we can add in the changing context of poverty. And, and the things that we can attempt to predict. But then the, the other side of it, we also need to look at the changing world that we live in and the possibility of disruptors. And I'll speak a little bit more about that. What I want to start by talking about is a little bit about the changing nature of poverty. And I'm probably t speaking to the, the knowledgeable here, but just to pull out a few things um, that when we're looking at what we might look like in 10 or 20 years that we need to consider. So an analysis by ODI in its Horizons paper of 2012 said that in 10 years' time, by 2025, most absolute poverty will be focused in low-income countries. Today, for the first time, there are probably more poor people living in fragile states than non-fragile states. This is maybe a little bit controversial because a lot of the debate today is about the number of poor people living in middle-income countries. By 2025, global poverty will be an overwhelmingly African problem rather than an Asian problem, uh, perhaps with the exception of one or two Asian countries. We know that global poverty has declined sharply since 1990 and is likely to continue to do so. And I saw I was reading a paper this morning that suggested that those living on less than $1.25 a day by 2025 would be 7% of the world population. That's a fantastic achievement. But what does this mean for aid flows and for organisations like ours? It means that the cost of closing the poverty gap is almost affordable. It means that the first port call for doing this should be national governments rather than international donors. But there's another sort of uh, um, issue out there in the agenda, and one that we've been talking a lot about today, and that's the increasingly frequent and devastating nature of humanitarian crises. And if 2004 14, 13, 14 is anything to go by, we're already seeing this happening. But what's the impact of this for an organization like Concern Worldwide? Well, we focus on the poorest people, we work in uh, fragile states, and we've had a, you know, sort of a strategy that has moved us away from uh, less fragile states to more fragile states. We work predominantly in Africa. It all looks okay. It should be fine. But can we be complacent? I would suggest not, because we have to look at it from another perspective. <clears throat> and sometimes when I talk about this within concern, I get quite a lot of uh, responses, but we've been talking about change for 10 years, we've been talking about this for the last 20 years, all this monumental change that was supposed to happen, it hasn't happened. You know, this is just more talk about uh, the same thing. Interestingly, the International Civil Society Centre uh, carried out a study where they brought together 20 experts from leading international civil society organisations, some of whom are members that are in this room. And that panel looked at the considered disruptors and the nature of change. And it, their conclusion is really interesting. I want to share some of those with you. I mean, one of the things that they noted was that change has always happened. And organisations, in fact, like ours, have actually helped bring about that change. But over the last 20 years, change itself has changed. It's become faster, more fundamental, and more surprising. When these three elements come together, scale, speed, and surprise, we experience disruption. 
To date, that disruption has been mostly confined to the private sector. And we, in 2012, we can think about a couple of very iconic brands, uh, which we saw the end of, Kodak and Encyclopedia Britannica. They have fallen victim to disruption. But also, we have seen some winners of disruption. We've seen people like Apple and Amazon, two of the most prominent examples of companies who've made their fortune by driving disruption. So it creates winners and losers. And much of this, whether you're a winner or a loser, depends on how the company positions itself to face that disruption. In, within our industry today, there has not been any examples of very significant disruptors. But the expert panel concluded that, they, they, in their opinion, it is very likely that there will be disruptors and they're probably not very far away. They also went on to look at what they, they felt were probably the three most likely disruptors. The first one, planetary disruptors, or planetary disruption, which is in a dimension all of its own. And as we overstep the Earth's planetary boundaries and accelerate, uh, they accelerate towards development will cause dramatic changes in economic and social disruption at a global scale. And this is very fundamental for us because it moves us further away from achieving our mission rather than closing, getting closer to it. But maybe it, they also identified a couple of disruptors which are actually emerging, and I think we're going to hear more about this tonight. And this is about our role as intermediaries. We're intermediaries between donors and recipients, and this is being threatened from different angles and all at once. And as disintermediation accelerates, much stronger disruption can be expected. And we can see this as individuals can give directly to people in, that are affected, as governments can give directly to uh, local NGOs. What is the role for the international NGO in the future? Another field where, they, where it was identified that major disruption is emerging is the increasing political pressure on civil society worldwide, which limits our potential to, at a local, national, global level to pursue our mission. So there are some very significant disruptors. Some of them are ready. We already feel the effects of some of these. What can we do about it? Instinctively, disruption and disruptors is a negative thing, and we perceive it as a threat. But hiding from it or fighting that threat is not the best possible strategy to tackle it. And we have to turn this fear of disruption into a positive perspective and look at it as an opportunity. We need to look at building disruption resilient organizations. And we need to determine what type of organization we are. And again, the expert group identified three types of organizations. Are we an active disruptor? Are we going to be one of those organizations that drives through change, uh, maybe by becoming completely virtual? Are we the opportunistic navigator, where we're really screening the environment and preparing ourselves to be able to respond and change quickly to a deep-rooted process of change in order to be opportunistic in that situation? Or are we the conservative survivor, we will build on our reputation, our size, and our bank account, and hope that this strategy to navigate around disruption as much as possible will work. Unfortunately, this is probably the riskiest strategy. But I suppose we have to relate this all back. If I relate all of this back to our organization, I don't have any answers for you. What we have is lots of questions that we really have to grapple with and think very hard about. Do we move away from delivery of programs? perhaps with the exception of the humanitarian intervention, to purely empowering poor people? Do we focus on becoming a technical innovator, where we build on promising practice and gather evidence to allow others to take it to scale? Focusing perhaps on the resilience agenda? Um, or do we have to be much more fundamental than that? And I think one of the things that we have to really think about is um, if we want to survive disruptors, we need the humility to accept that it is the world that defines our mission and not the other way around. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks, Rose. We're, we're right where we need to be. The world is changing. The safety net is required of humanitarian agencies is being threatened by disruptors that have already disrupted other major industries around the world. And our role as intermediaries is coming to an end. So how do we keep this safety net viable? 
That's why I've asked an, uh, a number of speakers to come and talk with us about different ways of, of financing this. We're stuck in this business model. We need bad things to happen before we can have the means to do anything about it. That doesn't help us evolve. We don't have any capacity to evolve.